The 377th edition of the Four Corners Podcast starts right now. This is the Four Corners Podcast. And that could make a difference. Lawson at the buzzer. Maybe not. Ty Lawson wins it at the buzzer. Deep three. And Green rips down the rebound in traffic. Four on one. What a great job. What a terrific job in transition. I mean, you could plan that any better as a coach. Gets the roll. Here we go. Page has it. Carolina down one. 84-83. Page into the front court with four seconds. Page to the rim. Got it! Got it! it. Nine-tenths of a second to go. Inbounds. Washington gets it to Warren. His full court shot. No good. Marcus oh, Page baby. dump it for the Tar Heels. Carolina wins it. Don't force it if you're Goss. Comes in. Blocked what? by Meeks. Barry right up ahead to Jackson. And he dunks it down for the five-point lead. Matthews off the mark. And this year, the confetti... It's going to fall for North Carolina. They're not going to be denied this time. Inside 30 overall. Love. Top of the key. Oh! Big time delivery. Here are your hosts, Josh Marlowe and Anthony Pagnotta. Hello and welcome into another live edition of the Four Corners podcast here on a Friday night. 20 hours or so removed from Carolina's season coming to an end with the 89-87 defeat to Alabama in the Sweet 16. And we're here to talk about it um, with you guys as, as we've been here all season long through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. We've been here um, and we'll do what we've done in every game recap so far this season. We'll, you'll, we'll, we'll take a look at the box score. You'll hear from Hubert Davis, stat of the game, and so much more. Um, but, you know, this one's different because this one is a season-ending defeat, and there is no discussion about what Carolina can do better the next time they walk on the basketball court because um, they won't be doing that the rest of the year. And uh, I'm not going to be honest, or I'll, I'll be honest with you guys, it's probably one of the toughest podcasts I've, I'll have ever do. Uh, we recorded after a, a national championship defeat. That was pretty tough. Um, you know, did a retirement press conference or a retirement podcast about a head coach that I love and worshipped and admired and adored. And that was pretty tough. Um, and this one, this one is up there. Um, there's two guys that, that mean a lot to us as fans the program, um, and I guess all of us individually, probably played their last game as a Tar Heel. And it doesn't end with them cutting down the nets and being able to hang a banner. Um, And that, of course, would be Armando Baycott and R.J. Davis. So we'll go ahead and get into it um, and and, and talk about everything we have to talk about. And there's a lot. Uh, But Carolina Falls, 89-87, in the Sweet 16 to the Crimson Tide, the Heels finish 29 and 8 on the year. Um, you know, a fantastic season. Um, and a lot of great things were accomplished and, um, you know, a great season and a successful season, but the one that, that comes up short of what the ultimate goal was, which was to get back to the Final Four and have a chance to play for the national championship. Um, it looked like Carolina was well on their way to the Elite Eight, to the West Regional Final. They built a 54-46 to lead at the half. They made 10 three-pointers, the most in a half uh, since they made, I think it was 12 at Florida State um, in 2023. But that offensive success, nowhere to be found in the second half. Carolina scores just 33 points. They shoot 25% from the field. Their worst half of shooting in a tournament game um, since they shot 22% against Kansas 
in the 2012 Elite Eight. Of course, that game, no Kendall Marshall. Carolina loses 80 to 67 as Kansas finished the game on a 13 nothing run. Just the second time Carolina's lost a tournament game while scoring 87 points or more. They lost to Michigan. I think it was in the night, the late 1980s, uh, is when they lost to the Wolverines. And the biggest reason why they got beat was their best player had a bad night, or our best player had a bad night, and that was R.J. Davis. Um, four of 20 from the field, 0 of 9 from three. Um, only game this season he did not make a three-point basket, and it's don't think it's coincidence that if he makes one, it's probably a different outcome. And this is a more happy podcast. And uh, when it's all said and done, you look at it top to bottom. Carolina put themselves in a position to win the game, but ultimately did not do enough to get the job done. And their season falls well short of where we were wanting it to, hoping it to, or even expecting it to. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be tough to win a game where your best player is 4 of 20 from the field. Um and it's just, I mean, it's just one of those nights, man. And, you know, it got to a point, especially with the way that they were defending the, you know, other guard spot that he, he pretty much had no choice but to try to take over the game. Um, I thought, you know, there were some times that they should have worked it inside in the second half. Um, but, you know, credit to Grant Nelson, who I think did a really good job uh, on Armando, even defensively in the second half. And, uh, you know, it's just it, – it sucks because it really felt like if this team was able to get past this game, then they had a really good chance to make it to the Final Four. And ultimately, like, look, maybe when it's all said and done, I mean, yeah, we'll, we'll still be pretty crushed about how the season ended. But when it's all said and done, I mean, if UConn doesn't, you know, win a game by less than 15 points, then – Ultimately, we'll probably sit and say, well, you know what? Did it even really matter? Would they have found a way to win a national championship? Because maybe UConn was just that damn good. But, I mean, it's just this – is, this is one of the more depressing losses just because it felt like coming in, there were so many things that Carolina would be able to take advantage of in this game. And, I mean, let's be honest, they didn't take advantage of any of that. Like the rebounding advantage that they should have had in this game. Um, just, I, I mean, just got bullied most of the game on the glass, especially, you know, on the defensive glass. I mean, Alabama was getting to every loose ball offensively, and it led to plenty of second chance points. I mean, Carolina had 22 offensive rebounds themselves, but scored less than a point per second chance that they got. So, um, you know, there, there there was those struggles. There was the fact that Carolina was missing a lot of easy shots inside. And that was something that, you know, as the season went along, you started to see that more and more, um, especially down the stretch. Now, the thing was, a lot of those games where they were missing those types of shots, the dunks that, you know, Armando Baycott was missing, some of the easy finishes at the rim, a lot of those came in wins for Carolina. And so we kind of said, all right, well, you know, they had some tough luck finishing, but it doesn't matter. They still won the game, and they won, in some cases, by double digits. But in a game like this where they needed to make those key shots, I mean, that's how you knew. I mean, RJ had one where he got all the way to the rim. It normally is an easy finish for him, uh, and he just shot it off the side of the rim. And that's, I think, when you knew that it just wasn't Carolina's night. And then, you know, the missed dunk by Armando. There were moments in this game that you watched and you said, because of the easy opportunities they missed, that this just wasn't their night. And Alabama, um, credit to them, you know, the second half, they were really, really good defensively with some of the things that they threw at Carolina. Um, you also have to give credit to the kids on the floor for sticking, and, and Nate Oates as well, for sticking to the plan that they had of sagging off of Elliot Cadeau, Seth Trimble, even after the success that those guys had early because – it would have been easy to react to it. And it almost seemed like he was going to when they, when he was asked uh, by Allie LaForce during one of the TV timeouts what they were going to do about it. And he didn't. He stuck with it and said, no, we're not going to panic and overreact to uh, what these guys are doing. And uh, because he did that, you saw it 
later in, in that half and then early in the second half that, you know, neither guy was really able to keep their, their the shooting nights that they had early going. And it allowed, you know, Carolina to basically uh, – it took Carolina to a spot where they were at times last year and uh, the, the, the few years prior as well, where Carolina at times was playing four, four on five offensively. And that's really what hurt Carolina – in this game and is why Carolina is at home and not playing tomorrow uh, in the elite eight out in Los Angeles. Yeah. I mean, I, I think um, if we're being honest, there was going to come a point in time where that was going to happen to Elliot Cadeau, where when you don't have a viable jump shot and we knew it was going to show up this time of the year and it was always yeah. going to be an obstacle and a hurdle for Carolina to overcome. Um, and, by, you know, with 90 seconds left to go, they had, you thought they'd overcome it. Because you're up three with 90 seconds to go. You you feel confident that you're going to dictate how the game's going to get played and how the game's going to get finished out. And I, I think that's where the frust- – that's where the frustration sets in is Carolina's late-game execution um, wasn't where it needed to be. And that's a troubling statement to say when you're the fifth-oldest team in college basketball. But it shouldn't shock us because we saw it in the middle of conference season. But we thought, okay, once they got later in the year that they had sort of moved past that a little bit. But, yeah, when they – when it cropped up again, they hadn't been in a lot of close games again down the stretch of the season. They had done a good job of, you know, really dominating and controlling games. And when they got in close games down the stretch, I mean, Carolina just wasn't able to execute. But I think we overlooked it at times because of the way that they were able to take over games and, and really put opponents away. Something that they struggled with earlier in the year. But, I mean, yeah, we, we should have known when it came to – this to, to a game like this because of what we had seen earlier in the year, we, we should have known this if it was at least a possibility that Carolina would have, you know, trouble executing, especially when they found a way to take away RJ Davis. Well, I mean, I, I think one thing that, that played a bigger role in, in this one than in the other games is this is the best offensive team that you played. And, and so there was, added pressure in those final four minutes because empty possessions just felt they just they were they were just killers Mm -hmm. um and and it it, you could you could watch it when carolina got down five you know the life had been sucked out of them and i thought great timeout by huber davis um carolina rips the next six points out of out of the timeout and you think, okay, they responded. They've gotten the stops. They're scoring. Um, you're gonna, you're gonna close this thing out. And um, you know, you're up one. It's it's 85, 84, and the ball finds Jalen Withers' hands, um, which is what Alabama wanted the ball to go. That's where they wanted the ball to end up. A 21 percent three point shooter. Um, have no problem with him being on the floor. I mean, he actually started the 6-0 run that got Carolina the lead after being down five. But, you know, that's that's a an awareness situation where there's a reason why you're open. Um, and, and, you know, I know RJ was struggling. you rather have the ACC player of the year take that shot. you rather have a guy that, you know, all night you just felt at some point was going to put the ball in the basket because that's what he does. That's who he is. This guy's got the fourth most points in uh, in a single season in Carolina history. Like, you thought the ball was going to find the bottom of the net at some point, and it didn't happen. And- well, you know, let, let's, be, let's, be, let's be honest here. And look, man, guys make mistakes. It, it happens. You would have rather anybody else on the floor taking that shot than Jalen Withers. That shot. I don't have a problem with him getting the ball and looking to score. But you just did it earlier in in the half, a few minutes prior, you had driven the basket and you had been able to finish inside. And that's the strength of your game, man. We saw that, you know, in the game against Wagner. That was what he was able to do. 
So, I, I mean, look, I don't have a problem with him being confident in himself and looking for a shot. Dude, nobody else was playing great in that second half. But you cannot take that shot in that moment. You just can't. And then you go to the other end of the floor. That, that I mean, just one of the worst sequences that you could possibly have, unfortunately for him. Because then you go to the other end of the floor, Baycott doubles and helps on Sears, and you try to rotate over, you rotate late, and you foul Grant Nelson, and it's an end one. And that pretty much effectively ended the game. And, and that's – I mean, I hate it for him, man, because he did, so, he did so many good things for this team late in the season. And he had such a good showing here in Charlotte in his hometown. But that's going to be the moment that most people are probably going to remember for him. And it's it it just it sucks because this this team I mean I hate that that's the way that they have to go out that there's going to be guys that are going to be villainized because it's not it's not just him like the amount of people that that want to go after R.J. Davis for this performance I mean dude I heard it on my radio show this morning well he no showed during this what the hell is that that's that is the lamest phrasing I've ever heard in my life yeah I'm sure that the dude literally said yep. This is the game I'm going to decide to take off. Like, get the hell out of here with that crap storyline. That is the lamest thing I've ever heard. This team would be nowhere without R.J. Davis. Like, this dude, the the, the number talking about, they, they should be considering retiring his number when it's all said and done. And there's people that are wanting to slander this kid. Get the hell out of here with that, man. This fan base is just, this is this fan base is something, man. I'm serious. I, I'm just I'm over this fan base at times. It just pisses me off. Well, I mean, it's it's what makes the tournament the tournament. And it's it's why it's the toughest dang sporting event in the world to win. Because the best teams don't win most of the time. Best team didn't win last night. Uh, I think if you play a best of seven, I think Carolina beats Bama four times. I do, but it's it's a one off. And you gotta you gotta bring it every night. And it's not that RJ didn't bring it, but he picked it was just a bad night for the ball not to find the bottom of the net for him. And um it's been hard seeing the backlash that a kid that came back when he probably should have left and went to a better a better situation came back because he loves he loves being a Tar Heel. He loves playing for the name on the front of that jersey. He loves playing with Armando Baycott, and he loves playing for Huber Davis. And um, you know, it's why I think there's a really good chance he comes back because he doesn't want that to be his lasting image. Going four for twenty and going zero of nine from behind the three point line because he's a winner. And he's one of the best to ever put on the uniform. And, um, you know, I, I said it in the open, like as dejected as I was that Marcus Page got denied a national championship, I'm as equally dejected that R.J. Davis didn't get back to a Final Four. Because most of today's college athletes don't deserve anything. They don't. They're a bunch of crybabies. And they're a bunch of um, pansies that want everything handed to them and everything gifted to them. And because of the portal and because of NIL, it's only it's only getting worse. That kid deserved to play in a Final Four. That kid deserved to play on the biggest stage in college basketball without Caleb Love in the backcourt, without having to share the, the backcourt with Caleb Love. And um, the fact that he didn't, and he and so right now he's not he didn't, he didn't he doesn't have that opportunity. Absolutely breaks my heart. And then for a guy like Armando, um, you know he will he'll enjoy some sort of a professional career. He'll go overseas and be a really nice player in whatever foreign league he ends up because he's not an NBA player. But this guy will think about the rest of his life. What if I don't miss that dunk? And it's the oddest thing because I think he's missed six dunks in the last ten games. It, it it doesn't it doesn't make sense how a guy like him is missing dunks like that. 
But, you know, football is a game of inches. Basketball is a game of bounces. And, and last night, the ball didn't bounce Carolina's way. You take a look at the box score. Um, Carolina shoots 39% from the field compared to Alabama shooting 48%. The Heels actually made more threes. They were 12 of 32 from deep. 38%, a good enough number to, to, to win the game. Um, Alabama, 11 of 26. So you actually outmade Bama from behind the three-point line. They were just more efficient because they actually shot less threes than you, which is problematic. 15 of 17 from the foul line was Carolina. Alabama, 14 of 20. So you actually were plus one at the charity strike. Um, for the rebounding gripes, and I was I was there with it because I thought the rebounding wasn't what it needed to be. Um, Carolina won the rebounding battle, 46-43. The offensive rebounding battle, they won 22-15. Um, they did get beaten on the defensive boards 28-24. Um, 17 assists for Carolina on their 30 made baskets. Um, Alabama with 13 assists on their 32 made baskets. Carolina with just eight turnovers that led to 11 points. Alabama with 10 turnovers that led to 16 points for Carolina. Bama won the fast break game 8-4. Um, and they won the points in the paint, 36-32. Um, and Carolina held the largest lead of the two. They led by as many as 10 early in the first half. Bama led by as many as five. So um, one of the odder things, uh, like typically when Carolina's gotten beaten this year, you look at the box score and it explains why you, you got beat. You look at this box score, and there's a lot of numbers and figures that that point to Carolina winning the game. Um, but ultimately, that was not the case. And, um, you know, it's, it's I think it's another part of, of what makes this loss um, a tough one. Because in a lot of areas, whether you outplayed them or not is up to be – is up for debate. But you did, you did do a lot of good things that put yourself in a position to win. So – Let's get to the quotes of the game. Got some audio I want to play here. Um, we'll start with Hubert Davis, who addressed Paxson Wojcik getting the minutes he got in the second half in favor of Elliot Cadeau and Seth Trimble. Yeah, I mean, the way that they were playing us defensively, they were laying off some of our guys. And, you know, Pax is somebody that has always been – ready when his number is called and somebody that throughout his career has had an ability to be able to shoot the ball from the outside and so with them loading up on Armando in the post and loading up on RJ on any type of drives and then them you know I think even staying even more connected to Cormac after the first half that he had putting in somebody that throughout his career is more proven from the outside would give Armando some more space, uh, RJ more space to drive and be able to move. And, uh, and I thought uh, Pax did a good job when he was in there. I got to tell you, in the moment, watching the game, didn't disagree with this decision at all. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, yeah, we can look back at it and we can examine it from every angle and and, and – and say that it was the wrong decision. But if Carolina wins the game, no one's complaining that Elliot Cadeau and Seth Trimble didn't play much in the second half. It's not a talking point. Uh, when Wojcik hit the three, it you know it was like, okay. I thought his defense was um, as good as anybody's on Mark Sears. Yep. Um his energy and his effort, the thing that carved out his role for him was there. Like that wasn't, that wasn't not there. And so um, I know this is the thing that's being talked about the most. Um, I know Elliot Cadeau was very pointed in his post game about um, that was not the game plan going in, but of all the things that people want to criticize Schubert Davis for, I don't think playing Paxson Wojcik in favor of Elliot Cadeau or Seth Trimble was as big a reason as Carolina lost the game um, as as many people um, are making it out to be. 
whether it's from the local media, the national media, and of course our fan base. Well, I mean, it's just it's it's just people wanting to overreact. It's people that think that Elliot Cadeau is uh, some sort of superstar, I guess. And I mean, dude, I look, man, Elliot's got a chance to really grow, and I hope he sticks around. But I got to be honest, I have no idea if that's happening. Judging off of his his mom's uh, tweets after the game, same thing with Seth Trimble. In this era, I have no idea. I, I don't know. But, um, I mean, look, man, Elliot wasn't burning it up from the floor. He also wasn't defending. He was horrible. I mean, there's just there's just no way around it. This dude, the way that he finished this season was tough to watch. And the confidence left him. And when it does, there's just nothing that you can do. And his teammates tried to pick him up, man. And, and, and look, I find it hard to believe that Hubert Davis was just like, toss this kid to the side and we'll find somebody else. Like, I know there's people that want to believe that. That Hubert it would just was looking for an excuse to put him on the bench and not play him again, but I mean, dude, it, when when you're struggling the way that he was, like he was minus ten was he, when he was on the floor last night, like he he wasn't he wasn't helping you. You needed somebody else that could get in there and slow down these guards, and 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 Wojcik did. Um, and, and look, I, I think the explanation from Hubert. I mean, it makes sense. There, There is more of a track record there for Wojcik. But, I mean, he wasn't a great three-point shooter coming in I, to this game for Carolina. I mean, he had really struggled the whole year. But he hits his one attempt that he takes. The thing is, a lot of people are frustrated with the fact that it sort of limited them. Here's the thing about the mindset that most people thought that Carolina would have had if these other guys were in. They thought that these were guys that would have attacked the basket. These dudes didn't attack the basket early in the game. What what makes you think they would have attacked it down the stretch? Like the only guy that was attacking the basket was R.J. Davis. That was it. That was the only guy that figured out after a certain period of time that I need to get downhill and try to get to the line. And look, I don't know if that's – maybe that is on Hubert Davis. And, and trust me, I think there were some things that he could have done to, you know, execute better down the stretch – of the game. I, I feel like to a certain extent, there was a point where it was just put it in RJ's hands and let him try to figure it out. There, there's no doubt about that. I would have liked to see, you know, some, some more of the high ball screen to try to free him up and get him downhill against Nelson, although he moved incredibly well. So who knows what that actually would have done. But I mean, I, I just, to me, like I, I didn't, I didn't watch that game and say to myself, man, Hubert Davis, made a grave mistake by keeping Pax and Wojcik in the game. I don't think that either of the other two guys would have made that big of an impact offensively. I just don't. Like, they're, they're just they're, – there wasn't – neither one of those guys were able to stay in the rhythm that they were in earlier in the game. And I, I did not think the, that last night was Seth Trimble's best night defensively. I thought Wojcik was better than he was defensively. So, I mean, I know people people are angry about that. I mean, I've had plenty of people that have come after me based on that opinion, especially because they're frustrated that he didn't close out on, on uh, Grant Nelson at one point. Um, but, I mean, look, here's the thing. First of all, he gives you better size than Trimble does. And, I mean, I just – I mean, I think Hubert looked at him, felt he was playing better defensively, and said – I, I am going to lean on him to be out there, hold things down. We're limited offensively regardless of who's on the floor. And and it was really just hoping that R.J. Davis would eventually find him. And it just it, – it never happened. There were a few looks that R.J. had that if they go down, then you wonder if he gets into a little bit of a rhythm, including one that was halfway down and rimmed out. But I think that was really the game plan from Hubert. Lee Paxson, who was defending really well in, and hope that RJ really starts heating up. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing with Cadeau, um, you know, you're right. You 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 don't know what's going to happen in this era of, of athlete, of kid. Transfer portal is very much on the table. Um, I liked what he said where he said it's going to motivate me to – get in the gym so this never happens again. And that should be the motivation for him next year is to shoot as many shots and become a scorer 
to where next year, if you're back and at Carolina, Hubert Davis isn't taking you off the court in a tournament game. And it's there. I, I saw it watching him in high school. Like, it, it, this is not a dude that just cannot shoot. It's just – it didn't click this year. The confidence just was not there for the majority of the season. And I think that's the big thing that, you know, Hubert has to work on with him and Seth Trimble to a certain extent is becoming more confident this offseason, which can happen. Well, I mean, I think with Trimble, like the offensive game is there. It's, you know, he operates really good from 10 to 12 feet and building off of that. Um, you know, the percentage from three is good, but on low volume. Mm-hmm. If he steps into a starting role next year, which none of that is a guarantee because of the portal, like Carolina could go out and add a guard that still means he's coming off the bench. But um, what does that number look like? Like it, it's tough because, you know, you want to do things that, that get you to where you got. And Carolina doesn't win 29 games without Elliot Cadeau and Seth Trimble. They don't win an ACC regular season title. They're not a one seed. They don't get to the Sweet 16. But the tournament is all about matchups and a feel for the game. And whether we agree or disagree, I thought I thought Hubert Davis had a feel for where his team was at last night, mm-hmm. which was we're really uh, we're we're really kind of shorthanded offensively in terms of the number of scoring options that we have, in large part because Cormac went cold, and, and Harrison Ingram didn't seek his offense nowhere near enough. I, I think that's yep. what stands out about Bama is Bama's guys look to score at whoever had the ball. Carolina had a point in the game where all five guys were looking to score. In the second half, it was RJ and Armando are going to bail us out. And we, we said all year long, all once we got to the tournament, you needed another scoring threat to emerge. And in the first half, you were getting scoring from uh, Cormac. You were getting scoring from, from Harrison. It didn't carry over into the second half. Um, big reason why Carolina ultimately loses the game. Stat of the game, I, I went field goal percentage because it just showed you the efficiencies or the inefficiencies. Carolina scored 87 points, but shot 40 or 39 percent from the field. Bama shoots at 48 percent from this field, and they score 89 points. Mm-hmm. Like if Carolina is even remotely at their season average of shooting 46 percent from the field, they they win the game. They probably score 100. <laughs> you know, um, a big reason why was yeah they weren't as effective with their second chance opportunities, um, and then a lot of it was. You were 2 of 16 from three in the second half. And one thing this team has done a really good job of this year is when the outside shots quit falling to get back to playing inside-out basketball. Wasn't the case last night. They were 10 of 16 from the from behind the three in the first half, 2 of 16 from behind the three-point line in the second half. Um, you would have liked to see that number be – that attempt number be down probably closer – to 10 to 12. So. And they, they couldn't get out and run either. That was part of the issue. I mean, they had four fast break points in the whole game. And, I, I mean, look, I'd be willing to bet. I, I don't know through staff broadcast if you can find where those are at. I would be willing to bet both of those came within the first sequence of the game where they created turnovers. Because that was the thing, right? They did such a great job early. Hands in the passing lanes, really aggressive, and – I don't know if it was because of the way that the game started to be officiated. If if they they started being less aggressive, I, I don't know what happened. It was partially, I think, that Alabama just started making shots and the confidence probably dipped just a little bit because they said, "Oh boy, we're going to be in a foot race here." Um, but I mean, early they they just they were so active, and when they were creating those turnovers, it led to those easy buckets, and that's what this team desperately needed. And who knows, maybe they don't finish them because they weren't finishing great inside. But I think if you get a few of those baskets, and again, you you saw it. There were times where you didn't want to get into a complete up and down game because this team, I mean, Carolina's transition defense wasn't good last night at all. And part of it was that we talked so much about it coming in, man. Communication was big. It did not feel like they were communicating the way that they needed to at times throughout the game. 
But I think if they would have been able to get a few more of those runouts and be able to get some of those easy finishes or get to the foul line, it, it could have gone a long way for this team. Yeah, I I don't I don't disagree, but you know that's that's not the way it went last night, and ultimately um, Carolina comes up on the losing end. So there's our first initial thoughts takeaways from the season-ending defeat to Alabama in the Sweet 16. When we come back, more thoughts, more takeaways from the loss to the Crimson Tide. But first, we got to play you a quick word from one of our partners. Hey there, Josh here for the Autograph Fandom app. Want to get rewarded for listening to our show? The team at Autograph, co-founded by Tom Brady, is redefining the fan experience by letting users earn points for the acts of fandom they take every day, like listening to this show. The Autograph Fandom app gives you access to your favorite UNC content in one place and offers rewards like tickets, exclusive merchandise, and much more. You're already listening to our show, but now you can earn points and get rewarded for it. Head over to the Apple App Store and search for Autograph Fandom Rewarded and download it today for free using the referral code HEELTOUGH. Link and code are also in our podcast description. Welcome back inside the Four Corners Podcast, guys. Do encourage you to download the Autograph Fandom app. Use that uh, referral code and help us help you get rewarded for literally being a fan of us and being a fan of the Tar Heels. Let's get back into the loss last night to Bama. Um, you know, Jack Golke stole the show of the opening weekend with his performance. Uh beating Kentucky and, and, you know, putting Oakland in a chance to beat NC State to advance to the Sweet 16. Yeah, now he's hanging out with the Barstool guys in the gambling cave. I mean, he just completely changed his whole life with one weekend. He did. Um, <laughs> Grant Nelson probably did the same for himself last night oh. for Bama. A guy that scored six points and had two rebounds the previous two tournament games, um, 24 points last night. Uh, was 10 of 13 from the line, was 2 of 2 from 3, um, you know, made virtually every play that his team needed him to make outside of all the other plays that Sears and their other guys played. Um, but but last night, Carolina had no answers for him. And it's one of the few times all year long that this defense had no answers in totality. Um, Because this was a really, really good defensive team. This was the best defensive team I've ever seen in terms of effort, in terms of skill, in terms of ability, um, the way they could, you know, wear people down and and win games in the 50s and the 60s and all that. We knew that wasn't going to be the case last night. Um, And and look, you hear it a lot in the NBA where, you know, they play defense, but the offensive skill talent is just better. I think a lot of that could be applied last night where Carolina was in position. They were contesting shots. They were running them off the three point line. They were making them put, you know, make tough plays and you got the ball out of Sears's hands and you were wanting other guys to step up and make shots to beat you. And unfortunately that happens in March where guys from the other team and the opponent, they rise to the occasion and, um, Grant Nelson had the game of his life and was a matchup problem for Carolina and, and one they failed to solve over the course of 40 minutes. Yeah. And, and look, here's the thing about him is, you know, coming in and, and it, trust me, I brought it up too earlier today when we were talking about the game. Um, you know, it's, it's frustrating because coming in, he, he just hadn't done anything in the tournament. I mean, this dude had literally been put on the bench, um, in, in both games because he just wasn't effective. They used Jaron Stevenson more because they they just weren't getting the production that they needed from Nelson. Um, The more frustrating part for me is the way he rebounded. And don't get it wrong. He's had moments where he's rebounded the ball well. But to come away with four offensive rebounds, and this is the other part of that. You said that you were shocked, and so was I, that Carolina out-rebounded them. This is something that we've seen – happened to Carolina over the last few years in games where even they, they still find ways to out rebound teams, but it's when the rebounds happen, 
Alabama came up with so many clutch offensive rebounds. And even though they only had 15 second chance points, there were times where they may not have scored initially off of the offensive rebound, but they got to the foul. You saw a lot of that with Nelson. And I think he just, late in the game, he just took over. And here's the thing. It shouldn't really be too shocking because I most people probably don't remember it because it's been almost a year now and we were satisfied with the guys we got. I think, you know, there was more buzz around some of the other dudes. But remember when Grant Nelson entered the transfer portal last year, he was a name that we brought up for Carolina. He was a name that was brought up for a lot of big schools because he was a heck of a player at North Dakota State. But it just never really clicked the way I think people thought. And don't get it wrong. He didn't have a bad year by any stretch. But the, he wasn't nearly as dominant as some people thought he would be. And last night, you saw the Grant Nelson that Alabama thought they were going to get. And that was a dude that was confident, that was ready to bring the fight to Carolina. And, I mean, I, I just the, – the, his his ability to stretch the floor really, really hurt Carolina all night. Um, and, again, I think a lot of it goes back to communication because, especially late in the game, he got some really clean looks that if Carolina is communicating the way that they're supposed to, probably – don't happen, or they're at least not as clean as, as what he got. So, I mean, that's the frustrating part, but he's a heck of a player, man. When you have five blocks the way that he did, and it was, uh, I mean, it was fitting that he blocked the final shot the way, the way that he did. Um, you just, uh, there's sometimes you just, you got to tip the cap, man. He played really well. Um, but I think it was some of the other guys that were playing above the, back of their baseball card, as, as people would like to say. I mean, Rylan Griffin, 19 points, five threes in the game. Uh, Aaron Estrada, who had a good year, but, I mean, scores 19 in the game. He came in averaging 13 per game. So, out, out you know, outdoes his production. And even a guy like Nick Pringle, who didn't score a lot, but five offensive rebounds, every guy in Alabama's starting five pretty much outplayed what they had done coming in outside of Mark Sears. And they picked up Mark Sears, who was quiet in the second half. Whereas in the second half for Carolina, you mentioned it earlier, around R.J. Davis, they weren't really able to pick him up the way that they needed to. No, they weren't. And I think it's something that um, Hubert, I think, will look to will look to address uh, this offseason is getting – more firepower, more more punch in his lineup, um, because you just never had the consistent scoring that you expect to have at Carolina. Like you had four guys that averaged double figures, but that's because you know you 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 get your numbers to a point to where they're never going to dip. You know there mm -hmm. were too many games that Ingram and, and Ryan this year were non-factors offensively. But they made up for it with the way they competed, the way they they led as individuals, um, that you, you know, you you couldn't be upset and it justified them having the role they had on the team. Speaking of Cormac, um the neat thing about the transfer portal, as a guy that was against it, um, I don't believe in it. Um, I, I think you're giving kids an easy way out and settle down Dabo. It's, it's, it's why quitting is at an all time high. Um, there, there is good in it and Carolina has experienced that you, you got good in Brady Manick. You got good in Cormac Ryan, who in the post game press conference last night stood up for RJ Davis. The, this quote's gone viral. If you haven't, if you haven't already heard it, we're going to play for it here, but um, a really neat moment from Cormac Ryan last night. You guys can write whatever you want you know, about tonight's game. You could talk about RJ. You could talk about the stats. You could talk about whatever. But we would not be in this position today without RJ Davis and Armando Baycott. Um, Carolina wouldn't be in this position today without these two guys. And so say what you want. There's, there's just not a, a – true fiber in your being that could actually believe that anything that happened tonight could be the result of something RJ did wrong because RJ's done something incredible for this team. He's done stuff that's never been done before. 
He's one of the greatest Tar Heels of all time. And for anybody to come and say anything negative about RJ is unacceptable. And I'm going to just say that. You know, we talk all the time about uh, family and and what it means and um, how real it is. And when you look at it from Carolina's perspective, it's real. Like at other, some of these other places, <clears throat> Duke, it's fake. It's a facade. It's It doesn't exist. Cormac Ryan's been in Chapel Hill less than a year, literally less than a year. And he didn't get to campus till middle of the June, maybe early July. And he already won Carolina fans' hearts over for um, that performance at Duke that we'll never forget. I mean, one of the greatest individual performances in the history of the greatest rivalry in all of sports, right? This is what we should remember him for, is that a guy that in less than a year you felt like has been here for, in less than a year you grew to love as if he committed to Carolina as a sophomore in high school. And in less than a year, built a bond with two program stalwarts that, you know, wasn't a guarantee it was going to be there. Like, it wasn't a guarantee when Cormac Ryan showed up these guys were going to mesh and these guys were going to click and these guys were going to have a, a bond that we would never understand. But they have that. And, you know, it's uh, it was hard seeing – RJ's head just face down into the microphone because he feels like he let his teammates down. He feels like he let his coaches down. He feels like he let Tar Heel Nation down. Um, for Cormac Ryan to to say that publicly, um, I thought was very beautiful, very forward, and it it shows you what we're about, and it should show transfers the impact that you can still have transferring into a high level program like Carolina. Well, I mean, it's, it's so similar to Brady Manick. It's almost scary um, because Brady was very similar. Um, and I mean, yeah, it, it's, it showed that he's a great teammate, but it showed that even more so he's a great leader because there, I mean, it, it would have been easy to just kind of sit there and, and it'd be, be thinking about yourself and how your career is over and, you know, how, how depressed you are about losing this game. But he made it a point to point out that, hey, man, you know, RJ did everything for us this year that he possibly could. He laid it all on the line. And, you know, I don't think that anybody should be slandering him. I, I got to be honest. I think he spoke for the majority of fans in that press conference. I think that's exactly what most Tar Heel fans wanted to say. If they were there, if they were at that press conference, that's what the majority of Tar Heel fans would have been yelling to R.J. Davis. And it was a great job by him, too, to recognize, because that's the shorter version. That's just what Cormac said. But there's a longer version that Shelby Swanson put up um, of the Daily Tar Heel, who does a tremendous job covering uh, all things Tar Heel sports. And she put up the longer version, and it's – Pretty much, it's it's RJ basically trying to explain what happened, and at one point, it just he is overtaken by emotion, and Cormac steps in, um, and, and just basically says, "Look, man, you guys, you guys are going to try to slander RJ Davis. We know how this is going to work. You're going to put the blame on him, um, but we wouldn't be where we were at without him." And that's, I mean, that's literally the exact same rant that I went on earlier. Um, and it's just, it's, it's amazing to have somebody that feels like he is the pulse of the fans. It, it's, it's honestly why I think it was so easy to connect with him because from the word go, this dude stepped on campus. He came in and was a part of this team and you could see there was the intensity that was out there. There was the fun loving spirit. There was the hustle there was, and, and then this just completes it all. With a guy that says everything that Tar, Tar Heel fans are feeling and wanting to be the ultimate teammate. And you saw that last night, man. And I'm telling you, you listen to that right there. And you can make whatever jokes you want. I saw Duke fans making the comment, well, you, you know, you got 
This is a guy that's going to be an account executive. Well, that account executive lit your ass up for 31 in your building. So, yeah, show some respect. Um, but I think, honestly, that's a man that if he's interested, Huber Davis should immediately offer that dude a grad assistant spot. That sounded like a coach up there talking about his team. That That's I, – I, I watched that and I said, dude – this is a guy that if he wanted to, he could coach. The intensity is there. And, I mean, just, I mean, the responsibility that he has as a guy, and it makes sense because he's 25 years old. But that sounded, that 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 was exactly what you needed to hear in the post-game press conference. And I think he freaking nailed it. And you talk about RJ deserving a title. You talk about Armando deserving a title. Man, he, this this dude deserved a title too, because he is just an all time kid. I mean, twenty five. I don't even know if I can call him a kid, but he is. I, I mean, it, it's it was that that was amazing, and, and I feel I feel so bad for him that Carolina wasn't able to finish this off for him. The one last thing we got to talk about before. Uh, I probably break down because I've been on the verge of it for 52 minutes here. Is how much blame does Huber Davis deserve for the loss? Um, because when you get beat, you try to assess the blame, and um, there's a lot of blame to go around. I mean, ultimately, it's a player's game, and our players didn't make the plays, and Alabama's did. But you could argue that Nate Oates put his guys in the best position to make plays, and he did. Nate Oates is a fantastic basketball coach. Um, oh, hate the time, man. Absolutely hate the man, but he is a heck of a basketball coach. You know, he, he lacks class, and he needs to learn how to win with some grace. Um, but the guy can coach, and the guy can coach offense at a really high level. Um, I think – when Hubert Davis looks back on his career, this one will be up there because of the kids that he had and the the ride that they took him on. And he'll he'll hurt that he didn't get it done for him. But we entered this year with a lot of legitimate questions about our head coach. They were legit. We we it was it wasn't a guarantee that this guy was built for this job. It wasn't a guarantee that he was gonna able to bounce back after last year. Um, because last year was hard, and everybody and their mother had an opinion on what happened, myself included. From the moment this team took the floor in July to the moment that horn sounded last night. This program has an identity under Hubert Davis. And we know what Carolina basketball is under Hubert Davis. And I, I I think we know what to expect from Carolina basketball under Hubert Davis. And there's, yeah, could he have done some things different last night? Sure. But I, I've said it all year long. Even even you know big wins, disappointing defeats. Like if you didn't come away believing that Carolina has their guy, and, and Carolina's got the guy that needs to guide us in this this next era of the portal and the NIL and conference realignment, then you're just a hater. Because for as bad as Carolina played last night, he had his team in a position to win the game with a minute and a half to go. He had his team in position to win the game with 30 seconds to go. And uh, I know it's easy to blame the coach, but I I didn't come away with that loss last night wanting to blame Hubert Davis for Carolina not advancing to the Elite Eight. Well, I mean, look, the four-letter word that you're looking for to describe when, when, when it comes to blaming him is not easy. It's lazy. It's lazy. It really is because I've seen so many people. Well, you know, clearly he didn't have his team motivated. Clearly, guys, he's not the dude playing on the floor. All right. He did that. He's been through all that. 
I mean, can he can he will the shots to go in? No. Like they didn't they didn't shoot the ball well. And, and look, I, I get it, man. There were some things that I think he could have done on both ends of the floor last night. Some adjustments that he potentially could have made, but. Well, in, in all honesty, it comes back to the execution of the guys on the floor. Like, there, of course, there's going to be things that you can do. You you go back to every loss that any coach has had. There are things that they could have done differently, and they will tell you that. And he's going to put the blame on himself. Like, we know that. But, I mean, yeah, these people that are looking to say that they still have questions. um, you know, a, a national writer who is just, I mean, one of the biggest hacks that exists in the media, just using it as a chance to try to take a run at him and say, we've always known that he's not a great coach. No, what we've always known is that you're a pathetic loser that just, I mean, has a platform for who knows what reason. I mean, dude, you could you you could fart and find a guy that's better than him. I mean, let's be honest. The dude is a reject. And Used every uh, used the chance that he had to just take a run at Hubert and Tario. There are Tario fans that that are still thinking along those same lines that followed in that thinking that Hubert Davis. This shows that he really ain't a great coach. I mean, come on, man, get the hell out of here with that. Like, if you're still doubting Hubert, if you think that he's the reason that that this team lost, it's time. It's time to find a new team to pull for. Seriously, do not put yourself through this because this dude ain't going anywhere anytime soon. Like, we're all locked in. We're ready to go. We believe that he's the guy and that this is something that's going to fuel him like so many coaches before him. But if you truly look at this guy and you think that he doesn't know how to coach basketball, that he's just gotten lucky, he's lucked into a run to a national championship game, that he lucked into beating Coach K in his final home game and then beating him on the biggest stage in the final four and getting a one seed, winning the ACC regular season title. If, if all that is apparently luck, then I'm going to tell you right now, this dude must have a horseshoe up his rear end because, my God, he must be the luckiest dude on planet Earth to luck into this. He's not. He's a good basketball coach. People that doubt it don't know anything about the sport. They really don't. They're, they're just, they they want to blame somebody, and it's so easy to go to the head coach. And frankly, at this point, the people that were really going in on him last night, crawl back into your holes and stay down there. Like, I, I mean, we don't want to hear from you because you're useless to us. And again, if you're a member of this fan base and you still don't trust Hubert Davis, it's time to move on. It's time to find a new team to root for because you're not a fan. Seriously, see yourself out, and I'll show you the damn door. I'll kick you in the tail on the way out. The last thing I want to do is uh, play another piece of sound from Hubert. Then I'm going to read uh, some of Adam Lucas's article after the game last night. Then I'm probably going to cry. So here was Schubert talking about um, loving this group of kids and the season that they had. I've been around a lot of teams as a player and as a coach, and I've never had as much fun as being around this year's group. I told them that um, I needed them this year. And I needed – they restored my faith that you could get a group of guys together that – genuinely enjoy wanting to be a team and wanting to be together and it was a blessing and a joy to be around them for the last year and I'm just very sorry that we came up short so here's the thing about this um in theory this is a job and i treat it like a job there's professionalism um yes we are pro carolina guys but um Never have shied away from being critical because I feel like that's my responsibility to the audience that we have um, to not just sit here and then say it's it's sunshine and rainbows when sometimes it's not. In the last five years, it hasn't been sunshine and rainbows. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been 
It's been hard. I watched a coach that I love retire. I watched a program dip because of a global pandemic and had to question its standing in a NIL and, and transfer in a transfer portal world and usher in a new head coach that took us on a six week run that we'll never forget. Um, followed by a season that we all want to forget. And for the most part, we have forgotten about last year because of what this group did this year. And, uh, you know, I have uh, lived and died with this program for 16 years. And dude, the highs are incredibly high. It's like Snoop Dogg in the 90s. I'm on I'm on that same cloud. Wow. The, the lows are incredibly low. Um and this this group of kids led by an RJ Davis and a Mar- or, you know, a, 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 a Armando Baycott, a Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram made this job A really, really easy and B really, really fun. Um this is the first time we've ever covered a great Carolina team from November through March. First time ever. Um, and, and God knows, I hope we did it and uh, did a, a good job of it. But, uh, you know, Adam Lucas uh, put this in his article and Greg Ward said it was, it was great. Um, and it was, and he said, quote, I already missed the season more right now than I thought was possible. It was a connection, and now one bad shooting night in Los Angeles has severed that connection. The season provides a structure of practices and games and road trips, and those dates are on the calendar and can't be moved. Now the calendar is wide open, and there are empty days and weeks and months, and that time is overwhelming. Carolina basketball helped. It didn't fix it. And now there is no more Carolina basketball. And, you know, I think that's what I I look at with this team. From the moment I turned on a, a scrimmage in October to, you know, the final horn last night, there was a connection there. Uh, and I'm going to cry because I don't care. Uh <laughs> This is what separates us from, you know, keeping it heel inside Carolina, Tar Heel Drew. They do, a, they do a fantastic job. But they don't live it like I do, like we do. And it's... uh. It breaks my heart knowing that I don't get to see Armando Baycott play again. A Cormac Ryan play again. And maybe an R.J. Davis. So, um, the good news is, is he has a a potential fifth year. I don't think he wants to go out the way he went out last night. Um, And we'll be here to... uh, to cover the off season like we've been here during the regular season, we're not we're not going away. Um, we might take some time this weekend. It's a holiday. I'm out of town with family. Um, if there's big news, we'll be here to break it. We'll be here to cover it. Um, but we're not going away. We'll be with you. Um, you know, all off season and getting you ready for 2024, 2025, a year that I'm already ready to to get tipped off and get started. So in the meantime, we're going to encourage you to visit the website, heeltoughblog.com. Um, don't even bother reading the Alabama recap. Um, it was a crappy article. Uh, I didn't want to write it. Great promotion. Um, you know, be on the lookout because with the season being over, 
we will move into transfer portal, um, you know, mode and be covering that. And then Carolina is going to be busy. They're going to be active, um, looking to find the right players and the right pieces to put together a team that can put themselves in the same spot they were this past year, which is ACC regular season champs, a one seed in the tournament and make the sweet 16. So, um, check in on that. We have Drake, uh, Drake May's uh, Pro Day recapped. We'll be getting you ready for the draft, which is now officially less than a month away. Spring practice um, is underway. So uh, with Carolina's basketball season come to an end, we'll be able to shine some more light and focus on that. Still want you to visit the website every single day, HeelToughBlog.com. As for the podcast, guys, we encourage you guys to um, rate, review, and subscribe. You can find us on every major podcasting platform. Simply search the Four Corners podcast, and like I said, we want you to rate the podcast, review the podcast, uh, but more importantly, we want you guys to hit that subscribe button. Um, I think this is our like 120th episode of the season, um, and we're going to keep coming at you all off season long. So make sure you hit that subscribe button. That way, you don't miss any editions of the show throughout the Carolina basketball off season. Well, with that, guys, that is going to wrap up this edition of the show. Do you want to thank Anthony once again for hosting with me? We want to thank you guys for watching and listening. And as always, go Tar Heels.